car does almost have a religious status in the modern world. It's certainly more than just a practical means of transport. People get more passionate about their car than any other machine. At the same time, there's something very cheap and nasty about the things, the way they so quickly rot and fall to bits and end up looking like these ones. It's all such a vast subject that today I'm going to concentrate on the part of the car that people lavish most love and care on, which is also the part that leads to the car's rapid demise. This is the steel skin which gives the car its shape and its rigidity, the body shell. I'm going to look at how it developed and also at its structure. The invention that really created a market for the car by giving people a taste of the fun that could be had from a personal means of transport was the bicycle. <clears throat> It was the popularity of cycling that led to several intrepid engineers trying to go faster by adding one of the new internal combustion engines. Gottlieb Daimler added one to a wooden wheeled bicycle a bit like this. And Carl Benz based his design on a tricycle. <clears throat> Benz was a mechanical engineer born in Germany in 1844. He'd bought a bicycle in the 1860s and had been obsessed by the idea of motorised personal transport ever since. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, Herr Benz, I see you marry my daughter and I give you lots of money. Ah, my engine, my engine, at last I can't build it! Ah. He spent his wife's dowry on a small engineering works and eventually managed to make a simple engine and tricycle. Liebchen! Liebchen! Would you like to come for a drive? Hmm. I hope it was worth waiting for, Carl. You and your engine. Oh. 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 He never saw the point of faster speeds and refused to change his basic design. He won't change with the times, so he had no confidence. By 1906, it was hopelessly outdated, and his fellow directors threw him out. Could this be a boardroom coup? Oh, yeah. 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 At exactly the same time, Daimler was also experimenting only 30 miles away, though neither knew of the other's work. Daimler was really only interested in engines. He perfected one that ran at 900 RPM, over three times faster than anything else at the time. He then tried to find all sorts of uses for it. He was never very successful at making complete vehicles, but his engines were adopted by other firms and formed the basis of the first successful cars. This is a 1902 Wolsey. Cars had quickly lost their resemblance to bicycles and started to look literally like horseless carriages. The body, the interior, the wooden frame, the wheels, even the patent leather mudguards and the lamps are exactly like a horse-drawn carriage. In fact, the whole, this part of it would have been made by a traditional carriage builder. Mechanically, though, it's already surprisingly like a modern car, with the steering wheel and the pedals in exactly the same place. It is ready. He has bought one. Why, the fellow has the horse of his own yet, has he? Well, I think we ought to go and see what he has got anyway. Oh, certainly. I'm not prejudiced. Come along, Vicar. With a 20 mile an hour speed limit, which stayed in force until 1930, cars still weren't particularly Hello, useful. Gentlemen. How are you? Hello, John, old boy. Thank you. But motoring quickly became a fashionable hobby for the rich. This is part of a film made by Morris in the 1920s about the history of motoring. Yeah. Come on, jump in, sir. The 
the idea of mass-producing cars, started by Henry Ford in 1906, slowly spread to Europe after the First World War. This is Morris's factory in 1925. The bodies were still being made with the traditional wooden frames like horseless carriages. Although they were mass-produced, it was all still very labour-intensive. It wasn't long, though, before there was a revolutionary change in the way that cars were made. Well, you like it? Well, it certainly looks very nice. I think it's lovely. It's nearly all made out of steel, Dad. Yes, practically all of it. Today, all cars are built round a steel body shell. It's a good name for it because it is a bit like an eggshell. The material it's made of is very weak. It's the shape that gives it its strength. The steel the car's made of is uh, incredibly thin. It's only just over half a millimetre thick. And uh, I can actually just about cut it with a pair of kitchen scissors. It's a little bit of a struggle. However, when it's pressed into curved, rounded shapes, curved rounded shapes like this. This is actually the bit from uh, the bottom of one of the doors. Its strength increases enormously, is now quite strong enough to stand on. The idea of making cars like this came from an American engineer called Edward Budd, who's one of my heroes. Budd set up his factory determined to make complete pressed steel cars in 1912. His first successful car body for the 1916 Willis Knight looked indistinguishable from a conventional wooden one. Bud started making bodies for almost all the American car manufacturers, and in 1925, he set up a pressing plant at Cowley for Morris. The Morris standard ensures that the OK stamp is placed only on the bed, and that's how they get beautiful, flat sheets of steel. The bed? The car hasn't got flat sides. It has beautiful curves. Yes, I know, Miss Inquisitive. I thought you'd want to know how that's done. Well, those beautiful curves you like so much are made on huge machines called presses. Some are as tall as a house and weigh as much as 30 tons or more. The keen, unfashioned beauty of a great machine pressing steel. Five hundred tons presses its irresistible weight on a sheet of steel producing the rear quarter panel of an Austin 